Welcome to uh, CSIS Chevron Forum. I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, Steve Radlett has written, I think, one of the more important books on development in a long time. It's called The Great Surge, Surge The Ascent of the Developing World. Uh, I think I don't have to spend a lot of time introducing Steve Radlett. He's at Georgetown. Um, he was one of the architects of the MCC. That's not the McLean, what is it, community, community center, but the other MCC. We both live in McLean. Um, uh, he also wrote a very important article and then book called Emerging Africa, which if you haven't read, I encourage you to read. I think it's one of the most important articles. He did it with, with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, and now he's written uh, The Surge. He also has had public service. He was a DAS at Treasury in Clinton and then Bush. Uh, he then was the senior development advisor to Secretary Clinton. He was also chief economist at USAID. I, I think this is, I, I think the book and the presentation will speak for itself. I've got a lot of questions for Steve, and I'm sure you all will too. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to Steve Radlett. Steve. Thank you. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. Dan for inviting me, and for, for Helen, where did she go in the back, uh, and Aaron for all the work. Uh, they actually do the work. Dan gets the credit, um, but they did the work for pulling all this together. So thanks, thanks for having me and for, for coming out today. It's nice to see uh, some old friends and new friends here as well. Um, so uh, I, I wanna, uh, I'm going to give you a talk here on very big picture of the world uh, and developing countries, when I say the, the, the world, uh, developing countries around the world. Um, mostly for the last 25 years, but some of this I'm going to go back a couple of hundred years and put, uh, uh, put all of this into some context. So we're going to go very, very big picture and then try to narrow down um, a little bit. And I do that on purpose because I think we too often, as we read the newspapers every day and watch the news and listen to the radio every day, we miss the big picture. And we are swayed in our views by what has happened uh, overnight. Uh, and we all know, I think, the bias in the news is, is to be about uh, a disaster, something violent. If it bleeds, it leads, they say. Um, and it's often hard to find uh, good news in the world. Um, when in fact, uh, we live in, in, in a time of, of incredible progress. In fact, we live at a time of the greatest progress amongst the world's poor of any time in human history. There's no time that's even close. It's actually not even, it's, it's not even close. There has never been a time like the last 25 years where there has been more progress for more poor people around the world in more dimensions of development than any time uh, before. And by progress, I mean in almost any definition of the word progress that you wish to use, whether that is uh, poverty reduction, income growth, improvements in health, expansion of education, access to water and sanitation, uh, improvement in human rights, uh, the expansion of democracy, the reduction in war and violence. Uh, we've really never seen a time like this. Uh, and most people don't believe it um, because uh, they read about the violence and the war uh, that, that, that goes on. And I don't want to minimize the tragedies that continue to go around. Um, uh, so we're swayed by the war. I think we as humans have a, a, a bit of a bias towards thinking about, uh, about negative stories. And I think partly in the development community because uh, the period of the 1970s and 80s were so difficult, were so bad, that many of us still think that that's actually the story. And it turns out that in the 70s and 80s, there wasn't a whole lot of progress. But since then, there's been uh, a, a lot of progress. So we can start with, uh, with Thomas Hobbes, The Life of Man, Solitary, Poor, Nasty, Brutish, and Short. And for most of human history, actually, Hobbes was right. <laughs> um, and up until very recently, up until 200 years ago, very recently in human history, Almost everyone in the world, and I do mean almost everyone in the world, lived under conditions what we would now consider abject poverty. People did not live very long. They were sick. They never saw a doctor. They never went to school. Um, they, they lived in houses that were lousy, that hardly kept the weather out, that was full of rats and mice and everything else. Uh, they were lucky if they got two meals a day, much less three. Um, and otherwise, life uh, you know, was pretty bad in terms of, of, of the way that, um, uh, that we currently think about it. And to start with, I'm going to, this is a, a, a graph that goes all the way back to 1820, um, which is our best estimates of the number of people in the world living under a dollar a day. 
of consumption income. And this is, a, this is from two different data sets. to 1820 uh, and went up to the uh, 1980s. That's when their study ended. And then we've, I've, I've spliced it together with more recent ones from the World Bank, uh, also a dollar a day. But the point of this is the big picture of this number going up and up and then leveling off and coming down. So in 1820, by our best estimates, 900 million people in the world lived under a dollar a day. There were only about a billion people in the world. 900 million of them were living under in today's prices, a dollar a day. And if you think back of, you know, uh, uh, reading A Tale of Two Cities or, or, or anything else back in those days, life was not nice, even in London and Paris, the glamorous cities uh, around the world. And unless you happen to be a monarch or related to somebody with land, uh, life was not particularly good. And as global population increased, the number of people living in extreme poverty rose. Not one for one, but it rose. And actually, if we went back further in human history, this line really would have been going up from the beginning of human history, whenever you think that was. The number of people living in extreme poverty went up and up and up as world population expanded. And that continued up until right after World War II, where the number of people living in extreme poverty actually began to level off. And that's actually a big deal in and of itself, because in the context of post-World War II, with the world population growing, with the number of extreme poor leveling off, that's actually a major change. No change is a big change. Uh, and that, of course, has a lot to do with the, with, the, with the Asian miracle and the expansion there. So that number stays pretty constant up until the, the mid to late 1980s. And then for the very first time in human history, it drops. And it drops like a rock. It falls in half in two decades. After rising from the beginning of human history, the number of people living in extreme poverty fell by more than half in two decades. So let's zero in here on the last 30 years where we have better data. Um, so this, these are the most recent World Bank data. In fact, um, in the book, you'll notice that this is $1.90 a day. In the book, it's $1.25 a day because uh, I published, the book was published and literally three weeks later, the World Bank came out with new poverty data. It's really kind of them to wait. Anyway, uh, the basic story hasn't changed. So this is uh, the most recent data from 1981 to 2012. And the, the, the red line is the number of people living in poverty, so consistent with what we just looked at, although instead of a dollar a day, it's $1.90 a dollar ninety a day, uh, with the, uh, the number of people on the left-hand axis. Uh, the blue line is the percentage of people in the world living under $1.90 a day on the right-hand axis. And what you can see on the red line is that there were 2 billion people in the world living under $1.90 a day as recently as 1993, just two decades ago. And from 1993, that number fell from 2 billion to less than 1 billion. In 20 years, the number of 1 billion people were lifted out of extreme poverty in 20 years. Nothing remotely like this has ever happened in human history. Nothing remotely like this. And we don't have very good data since 2012, but uh, our estimate so far is that that number is probably down to about 700 million or below, meaning we've gone from 2 billion to 700 million uh, in, in about 25 years. Um, China makes up about half of that drop, but only about half of that drop. This is actually something that is happening in dozens of countries around the world, where this pattern of the number of people living in extreme poverty rose, leveled off, and has begun to fall. And we're getting that begin to fall in over 60 developing countries around the world. China and India, of course, but also Mozambique and Kenya and Indonesia and in Mongolia and in Brazil, big time actually, and in Mexico and in Chile uh, and in Senegal uh, and in little countries like Mauritius and big countries like India. It's not happening everywhere, not at all. Not in Nigeria, not in Sudan, not in lots of, not in Cameroon. Uh, not in several countries in the Middle East. I don't want to paint that picture. But in about two-thirds of developing countries, they've reached that historic turning point where the number of extreme poor is beginning to fall for the first time in history. Um, so, uh, so those are the poverty numbers, uh, below $1.90 a day. Now people always ask, okay, fine. 
So people have incomes now, consumption, above $1.90 a day. Are they just going from $1.90 to $1.91, or from $1.80 to $2 a day? And if that's the case, OK, nice, but no, no big deal. So what this uh, figure does is look at the number of people living in different income brackets all along the income spectrum. So on the left, we've got these same numbers, the number of people living under $1.90 a day uh, in 1993 and in 2012, and that's the drop we just talked about from around 2 billion uh, down to about 900 million. So that's what we just saw. The next two bars are the number of people with incomes between $1.90 a day and $3 a day, then from $3 a day to five, from $5 and above. And what you see is that we've got this big fall at the bottom of the income spectrum. I expected when I did this, I, frankly, I'd never seen anybody else do this before, and I thought, well, this is kind of cool. When I did this, I expected there would be a really big increase here between $1.90 and $3 a day. That is that most of those people that were coming out of uh, income poverty below $1.90 a day were having incomes of $2 or $2.50 or something like that. And it did go up a little bit, but not that much. There's a bigger rise in the number of people be with incomes between $3 and $5 a day, but the big surprise to me was the real action was the number of people whose incomes above $5 a day had almost tripled, almost tripled. That's where, so this action of in increasing incomes is not just at the bottom, it's actually happening along the entire spectrum, and that bar on the right is about an emerging global middle class, if you will. Not that $5 a day is a lot of, of money, but I'll tell you, the difference between $5 a day, between $1.90 a day and $5 a day means you can send your kids to school, all of them. It means that you get three meals a day. It means that not only do you get three meals a day, but the risks that you won't have food next month basically disappears. It means that you've got a decent house with brick walls and a tin roof, and you can keep the rats out, and you can keep the water out. It means that you've got a water supply and a sanitation supply. It means that when you're sick, your kids are sick, you can get medicine for them. That's what that means. It's a really, really big deal, even though it's only $5 a day. Long way to go, but huge progress. But throughout human history, this number of people in the world living in extreme poverty had always been greater than the number of people with incomes greater than $5 a day. And now, for the first time in history, it has reversed. And we have more people with incomes. Sorry, he knows I'm wandering around. So that helps. Um, <laughs> Uh, that for the first time in history, uh, we're getting people, uh, more people, far more people, with incomes greater than $5 a day compared to those with incomes less than $1.90 a day. So that's poverty and the income scale. Now I'm switching just to average income, GDP growth. This is a, so I'm switching from poverty to economic growth here. This graph is an index of the average GDP per person in all developing countries. Okay? So it's income per capita, average income. And you'll see at the top that it says that it's an unweighted average. What that means is that I've taken 109 developing countries for which I have decent data back to 1960, and it's an unweighted average. And I, I emphasize that because I'm not counting, I'm counting China like every other country. Right? And this is an economic growth graph. If I weighted this by population, this, this graph would be much steeper in terms of economic growth because China and India would count a lot more. So if anything, this is understated on purpose. But this is showing the rise in average income in developing countries since 1960. And there are three very clear stages uh, in, in the story on economic growth in developing countries over the last 50 years. Stage one goes from 1960 up until the mid-1970s. And here we have pretty steady economic growth. This is uh, Post-World War II, the world economy is doing pretty well. We've got countries coming out of the colonial era. There's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of exuberance, and there's pretty decent growth in many countries around the world. Then from the mid-70s until the mid-90s, we enter the period of doom and gloom. And it's 20 years of really bad news in developing countries. The average income growth around the world in developing countries for those 20 years is zero. No growth on average. And we know that a bunch of countries, mostly the Asian miracle countries, were having quite positive growth. That tells you that a whole bunch of countries had quite negative growth, and they did. About 50 countries around the world had negative income growth during this period. This is a bad time. This, of course, starts with the world oil crises in the mid-'70s, and we, we go on from there. Every country in the world is in a major recession. Uh, we get into the debt crises. 
Most developing countries are run by pretty nasty dictators, so there's a, a, there's a, a, a governance aspect to this. Violence is on the rise in many uh, developing countries with wars in Central America, Southeast Asia, Southern Africa, everywhere. It's a bad time. We get into the IMF, World Bank, stabilization, structural adjustment programs, a lot of conflict between donors and recipients. Um, and I emphasize that because it is this period of stagnation and lack of progress that many people still have in mind today yes. when they think about development. Nothing works. The mental picture. There's never any progress. The, IM, the aid programs don't work. The countries are all a bunch of corrupt dictators. They throw their people in jail. It's all war and famine and poverty. That ended 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It ended in the mid-90s for the most part. And we can see phase three here begins in the 1990s, where economic growth takes off and accelerates uh, uh, really around the world in, in, in developing countries. Uh, again, not just in China, but in dozens of countries around, uh, around the world. Uh, and something happened, and we'll come back to what that something is uh, in a bit, but the average incomes in developing countries, unweighted, have almost doubled in the last 20 years. Okay. And unweighted, that's not giving China the extra weight or India uh, the extra weight. Uh, it is uh, um, counting each country individually. So again, if anything, that's understated. But the average per capita income in developing countries around the world has doubled in real terms in the last two decades. Again, nothing like that uh, has ever happened before. And this graph, uh, this figure is just to underline this point that this is far more than China and India. This counts countries. Now I'm counting countries. How many countries had growth per person, per capita, income growth per person, that exceeded 2% per capita? A modest but decent standard. That's actually the U.S. growth rate over the last 200 years is 2% per capita. I have multiple microphones going on here. We're just going to use this, this one. This is great. Cool. Good. It's like belt and suspenders it's, with the AV. Exactly. It's, it's great. holding everything up. Um, that's much better, actually. Uh, so this is counting countries. How many countries, developing countries, exceeded 2% growth per capita in that 20-year period from the mid-70s to the mid-90s? 21 out of 109. Only one out of five countries met 2% per capita growth. Since then, it's 71 countries out of my same sample of 109. 50 countries have shifted up. How many countries have had growth per capita exceeding 4%? Well, it was only 10, now it's 30. 30 out of 109, almost a third, have had growth for two decades exceeding 4% per capita. That's actually fast growth. At 4% per capita, uh, incomes double quite rapidly, uh, actually, uh, in 18 years, to be precise. Incomes double uh, in 18 years. Uh, at growth of 4% per capita. It's really fast. And 30 out of 109 developing countries have achieved that now for the last two decades. How many countries had negative growth? Well, it was 51, as I said before. Uh, half of developing countries had negative growth rates. Now we're down to 10. So yes, we still have the disasters, and they make the news of Sudan and of Nigeria is not negative, but Jamaica is negative, Haiti uh, is negative, uh, Central African Republic uh, is negative. So we still have the disasters, but they are the exception now. They used to be almost the rule, but now they are clearly the exception. But we always still focus on, uh, uh, on the negative cases. So this is much more widespread um, uh, uh, around the world. Okay, so that's growth. A uh, couple slides on inequality, because of course we all know, we all know for sure that income inequality around the world has gotten worse. We all know that? Yep, yeah, yeah, except it hasn't, actually. It's gotten worse in the United States, no, for sure. And it's gotten worse in several other countries in Europe, uh, and, and that is true. But at a global scale, it actually has gotten much better. And here's why, before we look at the graph, if you think about it. There are two billion people in China and India whose incomes have been growing quite rapidly <laughs> for a long time, whereas our incomes have been growing but not that fast. So the gap between our incomes at the rich end and those two billion people have actually converged, as economists talk about it. Instead of those incomes diverging for the last 200 years, for the last 20 or 30 years, they have actually converged. And it's not just India and China, it's also Indonesia and Brazil and Pakistan and many other countries around the world, those 70 countries that I just mentioned, 
that are growing at more than 2% per capita, all these countries are basically growing faster than the United States and the rich countries over the last 20 years. And so they are actually catching up, some quite rapidly, some less so, but there is actually some convergence going on. And what that means is that at a global level, income distribution is getting better. So here's one way we look at it. The most standard measure for income distribution is called the Gini coefficient, which just is a standard measure that most of you are familiar with. Higher number means worse inequality. Lower number means actually better inequality. And this, is th this particular measure of income inequality, and there are many, but this one is measuring across countries, rich countries relative to poor countries, which is slightly different from rich people versus poor people, which is actually a lot harder to do on a global scale. But this is a hint. Uh, and if you look at the gap between rich countries and poor countries, again, the blue line is population weighted, the red line is unweighted. So the, the red line just counts every country individually. The blue line puts a lot more weight on China and India. And you can see by either measure since 2000, global income in distribution has gotten better and quite significantly so. Uh, the red line was getting worse in the 70s and 80s because still there were a lot of developing countries that hadn't taken off yet. The blue line was getting better then because China had taken off and it's so big it counts a lot. So the blue line started going down first because China is so big and had expanded quickly. But either measure, uh, those things have been, uh, income distribution has been getting better on a, on a global scale. Branko Milanovic put these numbers together. He's got a new book out, The Haves and the Have Not. He's got another new book out actually. And he also has some estimates on individual income inequality. Um, and it looks like it's actually getting better on a global scale. There really is, it's very hard to justify the argument on a global scale that income, in, uh, that, in, that income inequality is getting worse. The data just don't back it up. And those of you that have read Thomas Piketty's book, well, there's actually only about three people in the world that have actually read the entire book uh, by Thomas Piketty uh, on, on capital. But uh, his argument is all about developing, uh, develop richer countries. He actually um, has about three paragraphs on emerging countries and does not say anything about developing countries. So this is not inconsistent with Piketty's argument at all. He's just talking about the rich countries, and I'm talking about uh, countries globally. On that point on inequality, now a different way to look at it is within developing countries. So how many developing countries has income inequality within that country gotten better or worse or stayed about the same? And it turns out there's no clear pattern. Out of, uh, I came up with 80 developing countries, uh, in which I had income inequality data for at least 10 years, so I could look at earlier and later. And out of those 80 developing countries, 37 income distribution has actually improved over the last 10 years. Brazil is a major case in point here. Indonesia uh, is another. 22 countries, it had changed little. And in 21 countries, it had actually worsened. And I have my definition uh, uh, this is uh, looking at whether the income share of the poorest 40% and what had happened to that income share over time. Um, and so this is not a, 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 I'm not trying to make the point that hooray, income inequality is getting better everywhere. That's wrong. But I am trying to uh, push back against the widely held view that income inequality is getting worse everywhere around the world. It just isn't true. <laughs> And it's really hard to hold up that argument. And I think it's just a bit of a bias because that's what's happening in the United States. So that's income inequality. Now I'm going to shift to health. This is the rate of uh, child mortality, under five mortality, wow. um, the share of children that die before their fifth birthday. And in 1960, 22% of children in developing countries were dead before their fifth birthday, uh, more than one out of five, which is actually hard to believe. But that's the way it was. And frankly, if you go back a century, that's the way it was here, and certainly the way it was in England and France and everywhere else, that 25 30% of children never made it to their fifth birthday uh, for a variety of reasons. But as recently as 1960, one out of five kids uh, were dead before the age of five. We're now down to less than 5% of children dying. Um, before age uh, five, which frankly is still too high. That's one out of 20. It's still frankly not acceptable. But it's a whole lot better than 22%. Uh, than and that 22% drop to 5% means that 17% of children now living in developing countries would have died, and now they live. 
and they live longer, and they live healthier, and their incomes are higher. This is not a story that they live longer in misery, which is what many people think. They actually live longer and with, more, uh, with greater prosperity. Uh, and, and this, what's remarkable about this number, I, I said on the poverty numbers and the growth numbers that those were happening in many developing countries, but not all. Not true here. This is happening everywhere. If you look at the rate of child death, 1980 and today, in every single country in the world, that rate of child death mm. has fallen, period. I'm not going to say except, because there are no exceptions. Every single country in the world where we have data, <laughs> I don't know about Somalia, <laughs> but every single country in the world where we have data, this rate has fallen. And we have some data in North Korea, and it has fallen. And in Myanmar, and in Papua New Guinea, and in Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, and Cameroon, and Zimbabwe under Uncle Bob. Mugabe, and everywhere else, this has fallen. I do not know of any socioeconomic indicator that has improved in every single country in the world at the same time ever before. I actually think that this is one of the greatest single achievements in human history, and almost nobody knows about it. This is a story about vaccines. This is a story about the fight against smallpox, more recently about malaria, TB, to some extent HIV in the last few years. This is a story about building health systems. And it is one of the single best stories about globalization that I know, because this does not happen without globalization, without getting vaccines from factories in the United States to villages in northern Mozambique coupled with aid agencies helping to facilitate that, with local heroes that get the moms to bring their kids uh, to the clinics, uh, with local governments funding those clinics. It takes everybody to make this work. And this is actually globalization at its best, and it has saved millions of lives. Now, some people look at this and they say, oh, but all this is going to do is add to global population. When, few, when fewer kids die, that means global population growths take off. True or false? Helen knows. Where'd she go? She hides. She was my student, so she knows. True or false? She was sleeping on the question. False. She gets bad marks. False. Actually, people think, well, this will add to global population growth. It actually does just the opposite. This slows global population growth with a generation lag. Why? Because more children live. Mothers figure this out. When a lot of children die, they overcompensate and have more children than they want to live into adulthood. And so they have a lot of children to overcompensate. Because if you have more children, that's actually not as bad as having too few children. Because if you have too few children, nobody will take care of you in adulthood. So as infant mortality rates fall, the next generation of women figure this out. And they, fertility rates drop very rapidly. And population growth rates drop very rapidly. And this is why global population growth has actually been slowing since the late 1960s, not rising. And it has been falling in almost every region of the world. Uh, life expectancy has grown. These are just the life expectancy figures at birth and contingent on age five. People used to live 50 years. Now they live 65 years in developing countries. So that's the health story. Education. This uh, graph, the, the blue in the middle, uh, is for, uh, uh, sorry, the, the gold on the left is for all population. The blue is for men. The red is for women. This is the average years of education of an adult. So this is not school enrollment rates. This is not school completion rates. This is ask an adult, how many years of schooling did you have? And in 1970, the average person in a developing country had three and a half years of education. Now around the world, the average is seven. That's still too low. But that means that, on average, around the world, people are getting twice as much education as they were just a couple of decades ago. And on average, people are now getting through elementary school. Doesn't sound like much, but actually, it's a really big shift. And this three and a half years of education in 1970, I don't know what it was before that, but I can assure you in the colonial era, it was a lot less. <laughs> so this is only going up. And there's a gap, of course, between men and women. Uh, and that gap continues, but that gap is shrinking, actually. When you get out to the, the left side, uh, uh, men have an average of seven and a half years of education. Women have an average of six and a half years of education. So the gap is closing. And that's indicative of girls in school. So now I'm switching from adults back to kids in school. And this, is, uh, this shows the uh, rate 
of primary school completion for girls. What percentage of girls actually complete primary school? It used to wow. be just 60%, and now we're up to 90% of girls in developing countries complete primary school. This is an enormous game changer for the future. I'm going to talk about the future in a few minutes, but a lot of people ask, can this be sustained? And there's a lot of dimensions to that. But this is one of the reasons why I have a fair amount of confidence that this is going to continue in the future, because we're educating girls today, and that's going to change things Amen. tomorrow. Because that means that these girls that are now completing primary school are going to have more income opportunities for themselves. That means they're going to have fewer children. That means their children are going to be healthier. Their children are going to have more income opportunities. Uh, and their families are going to be far better off. And so we have already, the world has already planted the seeds now for the next generation of people in developing countries to be healthier and be better educated because of this. So this is actually a really big deal as well. OK, now shifting from poverty and income and health and education, now democracy. This is a count of the number of, of developing countries in the world that are democracies. There are lots of definitions of democracy. I've looked at them all. I've used most of them. They all tell basically the same story. This is a combined index from Freedom House, which looks at rights, political rights and civil liberties, combined with an index put together by the University of Maryland called the Polity IV Index, which looks at the quality of institutions, elections and, and uh, uh, opposition in the uh, legislative body. So it's both an institutional index and a political index. Um, there's no debate about the direction. A different index, we'd have slightly different numbers, higher or lower. In the 1970s, only about 10 or 12 developing countries around the world would count as a democracy. India, Costa Rica, Mauritius, Botswana, a few others. Almost everywhere it was dictators, as we all know. Not anymore. Something happened in the early 90s, and the dictators, for a large part, are gone. And democracy is on the rise. Not completely, but to a very large extent. Think of Latin America. 30 years ago. It was all generals and dictators, all of it, really, except Costa Rica, um, all of it. And it started to change in the 1980s with Chile's messy transition. Uh, Argentina has been messy as well, but then Brazil, and now all of Central America. And today, across Latin America, it's all democracies, except Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, Perhaps we can argue about a few, but there has been a major transformation towards better governance. They're not perfect. They don't always observe the best human rights. The elections don't always go very well. The political discourse is a little crazy. Uh, there's a lot of corruption going on, and it sounds a little bit like Washington, D.C. Um, but I say this. Uh, and we can talk about this more if, if questions come up. We have a tendency to be very critical that de young democracies in developing countries aren't moving forward fast enough. And we are incredibly forgetful about our own history of 240 years, which started with all men are created equal. And what we mo meant was all white men that own land were created equal. And later we said, well, if you don't own land, that's OK. And then 100 years later, OK, we're going to add women. And then 100 and Almost 200 years later, we finally decided to give blacks the vote, and we still aren't anywhere close to it. This is hard. This democracy thing is really hard. And this, uh, up until this time, most people believe that democracy just wouldn't work in developing countries. There's a whole modernization theory that basically says it isn't going to work. This is a grand experiment in human society to figure out if low-income countries can figure out how to make democratic systems work. And we tend to take it for granted that, of course, it'll work. Not so easy. It's hard. So I get a little nervous when Americans and, and Europeans go in and criticize that everything's not right in countries that claim to be democracies, and they're not yet, because <laughs> we're not quite there yet uh, either. But something changed, again, in the 1990s. This is the number of uh, civil wars in developing countries. And we think now there's war all over the place. Uh, actually, we live in one of the most peaceful times in human history. There's a great book that Steven Pinker up at Harvard has put together called The Better Angels of Our Nature uh, that any of you that are interested in this uh, should look at. He's looked at violence around the world for the last 500 years. Uh, and it's hard to argue with the facts that actually uh, we live in, in, in one of the most peaceful times ever. Uh, and I don't want to minimize 
the ongoing conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq and obviously in Syria and in the Central African Republic. But 30 years ago, there was a whole lot more war going on. Every country, not almost every country in Central America was at war. All of Southern Africa was a mess around apartheid. West Africa, they were running around chopping each other's hands off. Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Uh, Suharto invaded East Timor, plus the Middle East and everything else. It was a lot worse. So we're far from perfect, but actually the incidence of war has gone down. And this is a big, this is actually, it, it, it seems obvious, but people forget about it. You can't have a whole lot of development progress when you're in the midst of a civil war. <laughs> you can't. The end of those wars opened up the opportunities uh, for people to move forward. Related to that, this is the number of battle mm. deaths, which has fallen even, even more quickly, far fewer deaths uh, from civil wars in, in developing countries. So there's much less violence. My last slide, and then I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other things and then stop. Um, I'm painting a rather, uh, 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 well, I was going to say optimistic. I'm painting a realistic picture. Um, but, uh, but I don't want to, but I'm emphasizing all of the good progress. And I'm doing that on purpose because you all hear all the negative progress. But I don't want to leave the impression that I've got some pie in the sky view that everything is getting better everywhere because that's false. It's not. And it's certainly not that we sit on our hands because now everything's fine and let's go forward. There are a lot of problem spots in the world. Uh, but the fact that there are a lot of problem spots in the world does not, does not undermine the progress that we see everywhere else. I hear this all the time in Africa, where someone will say, look at the progress that Ghana has made uh, or that Senegal has made. And someone will say, yeah, but you know, they still have problems in the Central African Republic, as if somehow <laughs> that should <laughs> you know, belittle what Senegal has achieved. So this goes back to my growth rate, uh, my, my index of GDP per capita. And that middle line is the, exactly the same one we saw earlier with uh, GDP per capita rising and then leveling off and then going up again. It's exactly the same, but looks flatter because the scale is bigger. Because what I've done here out of those 109 countries now is taken out the 25 countries that have had the fastest growth rate and the 25 countries that have had the slowest growth rate, just to show a little dispersion around that, that line. Uh, and the blue line are the 25 developing countries with the fastest growth rate since 1960, mostly Asian countries. Botswana, Mauritius, uh, Costa Rica, a few others are, are in there. And you can see that their incomes mm. since 1960 have gone up by almost a factor of six in, in 50 years. This is just off the charts unprecedented for incomes to rise in two generations by a factor of six for hundreds of millions of people around the world. The greatest economic success is ever achieved anywhere. At exactly the same time, the bottom line shows the 25 developing countries with the slowest growth rates. And for the people in those countries, their average income today is basically exactly the same as it was in 1960. And this is many countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, alongside North Korea, alongside Myanmar, which maybe is, is finally coming out of, of, of that space, mostly in Africa, but several Asian countries. Haiti is in this group. Jamaica is actually in this group. So it's not just Africa, but it's predominantly so. So we live in a world, in developing countries, where we have seen the most dramatic changes ever in human history for hundreds of millions of people, juxtaposed against a time where we still have dozens and dozens of countries that are making no progress at all, except in health. The one place where everybody's making progress is in health. With the same technology, the same world ideas, the same global system, we've got this unprecedented progress juxtaposed against countries that are failures. What you read about in the newspaper all the time are the failures. But what we're seeing more and more is more and more countries are joining that list of countries that are, that are, uh, that are going far. Um, so what happened? Without getting into too much detail, it, it shouldn't surprise you if those of you have been thinking about, well, what happened in the 1990s? Well, the end of the Cold War is a very big piece of this with the demise of the Soviet Union, coupled with the expansion of global integration, of globalization. Those are two very big forces, coupled with a third one, which is a rise of much better leadership in developing countries. Frankly, a generation after the end of colonialism, the big man of Africa disappears, and we've got much better leadership around the world a generation after the end of World War II and the end of colonialism. So those three forces uh, are at work. And uh, the end of the Cold War and the demise of communism is a very, very big part of this uh, for a couple of reasons. 
One is just around, uh, around conflict. We were supporting, and the Soviet Union was supporting a lot of those wars, uh, whether it was obviously in Central America uh, or in Southeast Asia or in Southern Africa around apartheid because apartheid existed only because of the Cold War and it existed because of its anti-communist fervor. Uh, and it's no coincidence that when the Cold War ended, apartheid went into the dustbin shortly thereafter because they were directly related to each other. And it's no coincidence that the day after the Berlin Wall fell, fell uh, de Klerk called a cabinet meeting and said, it's time we're gonna have to release Nelson Mandela. And six weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was released. So these events around the world are closely linked. So it was the end of conflict, but also a change in ideology that the old strong communist and socialist policies weren't working, either economically or politically. And it took a generation after the end of colonialism for a lot of developing countries to basically come to, that, to, to those ideas. And there was fundamental shift in the ideas around appropriate economic policies and appropriate political policies. And I do think that for all the problems with IMF, World Bank, conditionality, and all the debates about structural, structural adjustment and stabilization, those policies, frankly, were the foundation those basic sensible policies were the foundation that countries adopted slowly over time. Not fully free markets, because that's actually not the answer. I'm not talking about some ideological move towards perfectly free markets. I'm talking about a shift towards more sensible economic policies, coupled with a shift away from dictatorship to democracy. So there was a shift in ideas, and ideas matter quite a lot. Uh, and that was also coupled, as I mentioned, with globalization. And so greater linkages of trade, of financial flows, of ideas, of technology, all of those came together uh, in, in the 1990s to create this, this wave forward. The big question, and, and I'll just put this out and we can talk about it um, more in the, in the question and answer. The last third of the book is, okay, what, where do we go from here? Um, what does this mean for the future? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> And I thought about predicting the future, and I thought, well, that would be stupid, because whatever I predict will be wrong. Um, so I lay out three scenarios, any of which I think are possible. Uh, one scenario is that this progress continues, or something like this, <coughs> bumpy, <laughs> uneven. Some countries fall backwards. Thailand has a coup. Myanmar has a, 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 a new democratic experiment. Some countries fall backwards. Other countries begin to move forward. It's hard to predict where, but that this progress continues. And then in 10 or 15 years from now, instead of a billion people in extreme poverty, 700 million, we're down to 300 million or 200 million. And those infant death rates continue to fall, and economic growth continues to expand, not at China's 9% or 10%, but a lot of countries continuing to grow at 3 or 4%. And if, you can, if a country can achieve 3 or 4% growth per capita and maintain it and sustain it over time, you're going to do fine. It's going to take a while, but you're going to do fine. And more and more countries do that. That's one scenario. Another is that it's all stagnating and slowing down. Larry Summers' secular stagnation and others, that the growth rate globally is slowing, China is slowing way down. This has been a really nice era of progress, but it's really going to slow down quite substantially. And that may happen, and I think that's what most people, that's kind of their default, that this was all fine, but it's going to slow down. The third possibility is that it goes negative because of climate change in particular, or a re-rise in violence and war. And either of those could easily happen. And if they do, we could actually see this progress not just end, but actually reverse. And the number of people living in extreme poverty start to go up. And infant death rates start to go up because we've lost the battle with, um, with antibiotics and anti antimicrobial resistance is on the rise. And vaccines don't work anymore. And climate change changes disease patterns as well as weather patterns. And frankly, any of these are possible. None of this is. In, is set in stone. This is a matter of human choice. It's a matter of leadership. It's a matter of decisions here in Washington, in the multilateral institutions, and most importantly, the decisions that are made in developing countries themselves about the future that they want to have. That's where this will be set. This historical stuff didn't happen just by accident. It wasn't faded. It could have gone a different way. It was the result of a series of decisions, investment by private sector, investment by public sector, uh, and conscious decisions to save and invest and to invest in new technologies. If we, as a global society, make the act, take the actions necessary to slow down the pace of climate change, 
If we invest in the new technologies that are necessary to feed 8 billion people, 9 billion, 10 billion people, in terms of drought resistant seed, heat resistant seed, desalinization of water, new sources of electricity, if we do all of that, if we can actually come together and figure out the new generation of international institutions going forward, then this progress is going to continue. And all of that is possible. All of that, we can feed 10 billion people. We can't, feed, we can't do that with today's technology, but we can do it with the next generation of technology in the same way that we couldn't feed 7 billion people that we have today with the technologies we had in the 1960s. We couldn't do it. But with today's technology, we can. So if we make those decisions, both economic, investment, and political, at the government, at the country level, but at the international level, then this progress can continue. I know Dan's going to ask me why this matters for the United States, and I haven't said it, but I will only stop by saying it matters a lot for us and our own security and our own welfare and our own well-being, as well as for the people uh, in, in, in developing countries. So let me stop uh, right there. Thank you for your Good. kind attention so far. Can you guys bring that down? Have a seat. Good. Okay. Steve, this is a great book. My only complaint is I wish I had written this book. I think it's a great book. I did buy it retail, and I encourage you all to buy it retail. Next time you can and, write the and book actually and I'll put read my name it. on yes, it. Yes, and you can put great. my name on the back. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think um, there are, uh, you know, I think if you've attended any of our Chevron forums, the 50 or 60 that we've done over the last five years, I think you'll see why I wanted to have Steve Radlett uh, here, because I think the, the thesis for why I took this day job was, as I believe, what you believe, that there's been an incredible amount of progress and that we need to be thinking about the development future, not fighting the last war in development. Right. And I would argue that, and I wanted to ask you this question, are, are, are the institutions in Washington, are the advocacy communities in Washington, are we, in essence, fighting the last war in development? Yeah, uh, we are. And it's not working as well uh, as it could, despite this great progress and despite I have a whole chapter on foreign aid. And my basic take on foreign aid is that it has been an important secondary contributing factor on this. It is neither the failure that some pointed out to be, nor is it the savior that people pointed out to be. That's a little insulting to the brave people in developing countries that have taken this action. But where foreign aid has helped us to supplement, to push, to prod, to add to this progress. But you're talking about more than aid. But we have a set of institutions uh, and, and processes in foreign assistance and in trade and other things that were built for this earlier era during the Cold War. We didn't trust anybody that we gave our foreign aid to, so we set up a whole system of using contractors to put the money through. It had a lot to do with the developing countries didn't have the financial systems to manage the money, and they didn't have much technical expertise. And it actually worked reasonably well, despite the overheads and all of the other complaints, a lot of progress. That model doesn't make sense anymore for many developing countries. My slide that's still up here uh, tells the story that we now have very different situations in developing countries. The biggest pattern over the last several decades within developing is divergence within developing countries. What that should tell you is one size don't fit all anymore. And we have programs and processes that are designed for one size fits all that basically were born in the Cold War days when the world was run by a bunch of dictators uh, and we didn't trust them very much uh, and we were trying to make a little bit of progress. This tells you that we need at least two different kinds of approaches. One is for those countries that are succeeding. Um, so, well, some of those countries we can, we can uh, engage less so in terms of foreign assistance, much more so diplomatically. Um, trade but some or them, investment. But some of them we shift towards trade and investment, and to the extent that we use foreign assistance, it's actually to leverage private sector investment. That the idea in those countries is we can get more private investment going. They're good destinations. They're still perceived as fairly risky. What can we do with foreign assistance money to uh, to reduce that risk and increase the leverage and help these countries continue to stabilize and and and, and build that foundation. But at the countries in the bottom, this is a whole different approach. These are the failed states, the failed and fragile states, where our current model, frankly, isn't working that well. And that has a lot to do with poor leadership in those countries. It has a lot to do with conflict. It has a lot to do with, in some of those cases, borders being drawn in different places. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I have the answer to what we should be mm -hmm. doing in failed and fragile states. But I, I do believe that the model that we have is not working particularly well. And we're going to have to find new ways of engaging. 
we're going to have to engage uh, in, 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 in better ways with our, with our own uh, armed forces, our security forces, because some of these places are not very secure on the ground. And we're going to have to do this in a way that uses the best of their flexible resources along with our expertise in development. Okay. We're going to have to have a much better appetite for risk uh, in terms of recognizing that in failed and failed states, a lot of programs are going to fail. And we should be OK with that as long as some of them succeed big and think like venture capitalists, where 70% of your investments might be failures, but 30% are big successes. That means we've got to think about how we evaluate success in developing countries. And frankly, move away from where we're all focused on. We've got to have results. And I've got to have results now. I'm worried about that, actually. As much as I love results, and I want us to be results driven, the fact is that we can't achieve measurable three-year results in many failed and fragile states. We have to have a longer term time horizon. We have to think differently about what success Good. might look like. And we have to have an appetite to take some risks and fail. And we're not there yet. So we're going to have to have some big changes. I think. So I also read your Emerging Africa, and I referenced it earlier. And I encourage you all to read uh, Steve Radlett's Emerging Africa. But one of the things that I've always been struck by in that for the article was the, and you reference it here in the conversation earlier about a cadre of trained technocrats. Yeah. And so there was a moment, you, you had one of your slides that had sort of this growth period after 1995. Let me try something out on you. Yeah. I, 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 haven't, I keep wanting to find a couple interns, and if, if, if Connor's here, he's going to shake his head because he knows I'm going to want to apply some interns to do this, is I, I believe that there, were, there is a cadre of central bank presidents, finance ministers, prime ministers, uh, planning ministers who were educated in the United States, the UK, or France. And some of, some of it was funded by Fulbright, some of it was funded by AID, some it was funded by other governments, some of it funded out of pocket. But there was an entire, I believe that there was an entire cadre of people. And if we cross reference the growth and that change, and then we looked at where did those folks go to school, I would argue that a lot of them studied here or, or in OECD countries, primarily Anglophone fund countries. Do, what is your reaction to that? I lived for four years in Jakarta, Indonesia. I was working for a group called the Harvard Institute for International Development. And I worked in the Ministry of Finance in the early 90s for four years. And I worked for a group called the Berkeley Mafia. Have you heard of the Berkeley Mafia? With Joyo Niti Sastro and Ali Wardana and Salih Afif and a whole cadre of Indonesians that had, the reason they were called the Berkeley Mafia is because they had all been trained uh, at Berkeley with uh, grants from the Ford Foundation. And it, it would, the number of them that were trained was in the hundreds. You know, a big number, but not you know, millions. And they absolutely turned that country around. I mean, you all know the outlines of the Indonesian story under Suharto, lots of political repression, but incredible economic progress. And then, of course, after the Asian financial crisis, now they've turned into one of the stronger democracies in Southeast Asia. But at the core of their economic success, a success was a group of highly trained people that had worked in the United States, uh, had trained in the United States. And the same was true in Korea and in, and in Thailand and Malaysia. And I actually believe quite deeply that this mattered for their own economies, but also mattered a lot for relationships between those countries and the United States. I want them studying lived here, here. And they worked here. You know, it's nice if they go to National University of Singapore, fine. fine. But even better if they train here and they come to learn about the United States and they come to meet all of us here for so for our diplomatic reasons it's a huge bonus I think I want them studying here I don't want them studying in China and I think that's the, I think yep. that's the point I would right. make is that there are there are there are other forms of globalization on offer today right and if we aren't meeting the hopes and aspirations of countries they can take their business somewhere else right and you know, so I think that's um, it's I think and we've moved away from it of course because the security concerns around visas frankly after 9/11 and that has had a lot of impacts, and of course we all understand why that has happened, but one of the impacts of that is that we are training fewer uh, promising leaders uh, here in the United States, and, and somehow we've got to uh, figure out how to get back on track to do that. If, if we had former aid folks who were retired, we'll say the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, they'll say the, the most successful programs that AID did was funding scholarships for folks to study mm -hmm. Now, I think the world has changed in the sense of how universities are financed or how people get education or how people finance their education. 
but I think the general idea still stands. I do think there's a function for, for using foreign assistance dollars for that, for, for, that, for that reason. And as soon as I saw that, that was my first thought was. Good. And since I was, run a graduate program at Georgetown, I'd love to see more. Absolutely. More. You're at 40% now. We need to go to 50% for your program for, for folks in the developing world. That's good. So, okay, so let's talk about, um, I, I want to talk about the multilateral development bank system. Uh, and okay, so if we're, if these institutions are somewhat fighting the last one development, tell me a little bit, what, what are the sorts of things that, whether it's AID or it's the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank, in broad brush terms, and I'm not asking you to give me a whole strategic plan, but how should they be put, spending their people time and money differently yeah. if, if, given this? Right. So, you know, one I'll start with, which you didn't mention, but actually uh, I don't think changes too much going forward is the IMF because even as countries get richer, we found with Greece and everywhere else that uh, richer countries sometimes need that institution as well. And, and they're, uh, you know, they, they're, they're not perfect. Their history is not perfect, but I think they're, they, they have been uh, quite effective in, in, in many ways. So that's one that, you know, it can always get better, but actually doesn't fundamentally change. But you didn't ask about that. The World Bank uh, is really struggling to figure out why it exists in this world. And of course, it started in 1944, the Bretton Woods, and started as reconstruction of Europe, and then it shifted, and then there's now the five different groups that make up the World Bank Group. Um, but uh, but they're, they're struggling because uh, the developing country, emerging markets now have far more options in terms of where they get their financing. They don't need to go to the World Bank, and many of them are finding, okay, the IBRD money is cheaper, but it's a hassle. And there's all these conditions, and it takes forever, and I just want to go out and get a bank loan. And maybe that's fine, but what we lose is that we think that with a lot of those World Bank loans, at least in the old days, came good technical assistance, um, mm. some conditions that helped push forward sensible environmental policies and, and, and those kinds of things, all of which are hard, never easy. But as developing countries move towards just central bank, uh, commercial bank financing or uh, floating bonds, you lose that transfer of knowledge that can come along. So the bank is trying to figure this out and, and, and not doing a particularly uh, good job of it. Um, uh, IDA is trying to figure out its role. Uh, it, it, its, its funding is always under stress. That's and the, since, soft that's the, the soft loans, the grant side of the, grants, the World Bank. Concessional, that's right. And the number of countries that have quali are qualifying for those shrinking. is actually shrinking because of this great success. And I have another slide, uh, my more expansive slide deck, shows that the number of low-income countries as, as categorized by the World Bank has actually been cut in half uh, in the last 20 years. It was around 70, and now it's around 35. So they're struggling as to what to do. And one of the problems, uh, again, is that we are not geared uh, to work in these fragile and failed states. Our push for measurable success pushes us to middle-income countries and countries that are growing pretty quickly because you'll get better success rates there the way that Congress likes to see them than you will if you're working in, in, Haiti. in, in Haiti or in Burkina Faso or someplace else. And this push towards we've got to have measurable results is pushing us to provide more and more of our assistance in middle-income countries and less and less in the low-income mm. needy countries. And, and, and so I worry about that. So we're not, the MDBs and the bilaterals are just not structured uh, so well to do it. It didn't matter as much when, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, but increasingly yeah. it matters a lot. And we're hearing more and more about, you know, the World Bank, uh, you know, becoming less and less relevant. So I want to talk about the rise of China as a development and yeah. trade actor. So right. how should the U.S. think about that? What, what's your when you, it's a, that's a big question. Yeah. And so, so first of all, it's a, it's a big part of this, right? I, I framed in my quick version here, you know, a lot of these shifty, uh, shifts coming around the end of the Cold War. Well, the, end of, the beginning of the end of communism was when Mao died, frankly, in 1976. And, and Deng Xiaoping takes over in 1980, and they make internal decisions that basically are a loud statement to the world that the old system of strong form of communist, the Chinese believed, failed. <laughs> and that paves the path where all of a sudden in the 1980s, the Chinese have switched towards more, more open economic policies. Um, and the Soviet Union, meanwhile, is, is collapsing. So the, in some ways, the, the beginning of the change in ideas on the economic side um, 
uh, happens with China. And, and, and it's big enough, of course, that it influences these numbers directly, but also indirectly, because it, becomes a, 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 it has become a major trading partner in a very good way, a market for many developing countries. When I lived in Indonesia, their biggest trading partners were Korea, Japan, and the United States. Their biggest trading partner now is China. And there's many good things about that. And anyone descending from another planet looking at the map would think, yeah, Indonesia should be trading with China. It makes a lot of sense. So there's a lot of good from that, for sure. Uh, and they've been a big driver, I think, around this global process. How do we think about that? I think we have to think hard about how we were able to bring our sworn enemies, Germany and Japan, into the tent with us and forge a common view of the world. We haven't done that so successfully with Russia, by the way. But with China, what we need to do is find more common ground where we can work together with them in a way that will help our future and theirs. And I actually deeply believe that there's a way forward, that they need, we need each other to succeed, and the last thing we need is to fail. One of the most remarkable things about the rise of China over the last 30 years is it's been peaceful. Uh, it's hard to find many examples in history of a superpower like that, that big, rising on the world stage without military conflicts. And that's partly because Deng Xiaoping was looking domestically and not internationally. Now they're looking more internationally, and they're flexing their muscles, and it's causing some tension. And we need to manage that in a way that gives them their due as a world leader. And they're not going away. <laughs> and they're a big, smart country. Uh, but we need to do it in a way that's in our mm -hmm. interests uh, as well. This is going to unfold over decades. Um, and if things go well, we're going to see them unevenly, I think, move to more open political systems to go with their economic systems. Uh, and, but hopefully, along with that, we can find international institutions mm -hmm. in which we both have a role uh, in the same way that we were able to do that with Germany and Japan. I hope we add China to that democracy list at some point. So, you know, I, it's, no, it's no democracy. But the other thing that Deng Xiaoping did was he resigned from his positions. Actually, he resigned his last position formally the day that the Berlin Wall fell, which mm. is a nice coincidence uh, of, of history. It's actually exactly the same day he formally resigned. And he became the first Chinese leader to step down from leadership. Not that that makes them a democracy, but China now has term limits as opposed to imperial rule till death. So it's a, actually a step of some accountability mm. that you do not rule for life in China anymore. You rule for 10 years has been the norm. And so it is a first step and we'll see. And we know that no country has continued to become a, a world economic leader uh, without changing to having more open political systems. Either your political system changes or your economic system collapses. That's what's happened over the last 200 years. China may be different, but uh, we'll see. But probably gonna, not. Prob but it's going to unfold over decades, not years. Two more questions, yeah. and then I'll open it up. OK, so uh, I wanna, we're going to be releasing a, a commission report, uh, my colleague Shannon Green, on Monday. On uh, I think it's Monday, on combating violent extremism, whatever you want to call it. So uh, violent extremism in various parts of the world. Could you talk a little bit about, it seems to me that some of the interventions or some of the ways in which we should think about violent extremism has, a, has interventions that walk and quack like development or development. So could you, just, could you comment on that? So I'm not going to pretend that I have some simple pat answer to this question. But, um, but development opportunities, uh, opportunities for people have to be part of the equation. Opportunities, whether they are economic opportunities, educational opportunities, health opportunities, political opportunities. People around the world want opportunities, um, more opportunities. And one of the, one of the ways to help uh, reduce violent extremism uh, is to help those societies create more opportunities for people uh, so that the, the extremist elements have, have less of, a, of an audience. So the development part has to be part of the solution. Um, and if you think back, you know, if we listed the countries that were, you know, had violent extremism 40 years ago, we would have been thinking about, frankly, Indonesia in the transfer from Sukarno to Suharto. We would have been thinking about China in the Great Leap Forward in a, in a, in a different kind of a way. We would have been thinking about Central America. We would have been thinking about several countries that we would have put on that list 
and we would have defined it a little bit differently, but that have emerged and are now relatively stable and, and responsible contributors to the, to the global system. So I do think that, that there's scope for that kind of, of progress, but I don't wanna uh, undermine uh, the difficulties there. It is obviously gonna take a, mind, a, a change in mindset. It's gonna take empowering the people in those communities that want to take a more moderate way uh, stance forward. It might not mirror exactly everything we wanna do, but we wanna empower the moderates. I worry that a lot of the extremist talk here in the United States does just the opposite. Uh, it, it, by talking about all Muslims are terrorists, we're actually undermining the millions and millions of Muslims who we need to, 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 to take uh, more responsible uh, leadership and wanna do that. So we actually do things, I think, that undermine empowering the very people that are gonna be at the center of this progress. It's gonna take, obviously, working with the, uh, with the defense community and, and with our, uh, with our uh, security apparatus. So this is not gonna mm -hmm. be easy. Uh, there are gonna be a lot of failures. We're gonna have to step up and be willing to take big risks, but the development piece has to be a part of that in order to create the opportunities that most people in the world really wanna have. I want to, uh, one more topic and then I want to open it up. Um, there's a uh, current presidential candidate who has said that uh, we should get out of the nation building business. Uh -huh. And I think there's a lot of, po it's actually quite a popular position. Actually, right. if you look at the polling, people right. say that's, and there was, right. this is for 20 years, there's been a variety of presidential candidates who said we should get out of the nation building business. Right. So I want you to react to kind of a couple different points, not forget about who said it, let's put, put aside right. the source, right. but let's talk about the term nation building yeah. And let's talk about what is your reaction to that term? Mm -hmm. And, and it, I think it reflects specifically the, the 25 slowest growing countries mm -hmm. here because I think mm -hmm. that was a little bit to your point that yep. we're gonna have to rethink that because yep. there's, yep. Um, so what's your reaction to, so we, to we this? Need, so we, we, if, we get out of, if we're getting out of the nation building business, we're getting out of helping developing countries around the world, uh, frankly. So there's a language problem here. The, when people here in the United States use that term nation building, they're thinking about Iraq. They're, 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 ta they're thinking about military intervention, taking out another government, replacing it with a new government through military intervention. Mm -hmm. And you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and be a big fan of, 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 of that approach for sure, but that, the language of around nation building, um, uh, the, that language has been captured to refer to those kinds of situations. Putting those aside, and you know, they're complicated. What we do in development, if it works, is nation building, but in or a very different sense. Or it's state building, building. It's state building. It's building the institutions of an effective state. Because without the institutions of an effective state, you cannot have long-term economic progress or progress in health or progress in education or any other kind of, of progress. It all starts with an effective state, and I'm using the word effective, I'm not saying strong state, I'm using the word effective state. But you need, at its core, a nation state is all around providing security for its people, but also some system of justice, of law and order, some sense of property rights, uh, which helps at a personal level, but also at a business level, uh, some sense of an educational system, educational institutions, uh, some uh, sense of, of public uh, infrastructure and other public investments, all of which are co core roles of a state and you need an effective state to carry that out. And in many developing countries, frankly, because of the long history of colonialism and everything else, they're at the very beginning stages of building that effective state. And we underestimate uh, how difficult that is and frankly, the, the long uh, hangover from four or 500 years of colonial rule that was designed to not allow effective state institutions to grow and undermine that progress. These countries are still in their early stages, but what development, when we, when we talk about institution building and capacity building and training people uh, with scholarships to the United States, we're talking about nation building, but building effective states. Now we can't use those words anymore <laughs> because they've been disparaged and I'm not clever enough to know what the right words are, but uh, the idea that we can get out of, of, of nation building is actually very much against our interest because we, we need in the United States, if we are gonna be successful in the next 30 or 40 years to have stability, prosperity, peace, the things that most Americans want, 
plus spreading those to other countries, we're, we need today's developing countries and emerging countries to be effective states that can work with us as our allies and partners to stop the impacts of climate change, to stop illicit uh, traffic of narcotics, to stop terrorist financing where we can, because that happens in failed states mm -hmm. and we're gonna need to work with countries around the world. We need effective states, nations around the world to help us achieve our goals. From, so from a very core US-centric, you know, selfish view, we need the rest of the world to be successful for their own sake, but for ours as well. So we absolutely must be in the nation building business for our own sake, as well as for the sake of developing countries. But we need to change the language a little bit so that people aren't just thinking about the, the invasion of Iraq and, and Libya and, and those uh, things that have not gone well uh, that that term is applied to. All right, everyone's been very patient. I wanna, we're gonna collect three or four questions World Bank style, so you've got <laughs> microphones, so lots of hands going up. So, okay, I have this gentleman here, uh, this woman here, my friend here in the great blue tie, that's a great tie, and then, let's see, Tom and then, Hurley, who I and lived with in the Gambia Tom 30 years Tom Hurley, ago. exactly, and then, <laughs> let's see, and this gentleman with the red shirt. So, Good. let's and start ask, with this gentleman, and then we're gonna go with this woman here, then Tom, and then the gentleman in the red shirt. And ask people to introduce Yeah, inter your name, and who your organization is, and you get extra credit if you keep your comment or question short. Okay. Uh, Ishrat Hussain, currently with the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. The Washington, former BC. governor of the Central Bank of well, Pakistan. Well, uh, thanks to Steve nice for to putting together a very fascinating story and with disparate pieces coming together. And I totally agree with you that one of the drivers of this change between 1990 and 2012 or 14 was globalization. Yeah. But now we are seeing that the same developed countries which are preaching the mm. virtues mm. of trade liberalization, of financial integration, yeah of migration Very good are now retreating. Yep. Mm. And Northern England and the Rust Belt states yep. in the Midwest yep. are not as enlightened as you are or the Washington <laughs> audience is. And therefore, there is a very big risk yep. of retreat from that driver, are, yes, which actually is. elevated the 109 developing countries from an almost a stagnation yep. to right. a very reasonable, and I would say a, pr a trajectory which was upward sloping. Right. Right. But there is now it's a, a big very danger yep. whether this would be reversed, and you cannot right. really yep. stop the European Union yep. or right. Britain or this country yep. to not protect themselves. It's a, it's a good you question know, about our own reaction to globalization. But so I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting is, that- It's an yeah. issue. Yep. which I would like your comment. Good. Okay, this woman here. Connie Freeman, currently nice with Syracuse you, University. Steve, it was a wonderful to and hear. We're on a panel together next week, I think. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Presage. Um, it was wonderful to hear from you, and I have used both your Emerging Africa book and this book in most of my teaching. Um, you, one of the useful things about what you have to say is that it's based upon so many numbers and statistics to back it up, and yet those statistics come out of World Bank statistics, government statistics, et cetera, and almost by definition <clears throat> leave out the informal economy mm -hmm. um, in their calculations. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you how you think the informal economy impacts Good. upon these trends, yep. but not just the aggregate ones, because it may just follow Good. the trend, but also some of the sub-factors, such right. as, uh, yep. as employment, yep. and how we might better capture those statistics in our calculations Good. in the okay. future. Question, kind of okay, question. pass it down to Tom. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Steve. This was a really great presentation. Um, of course, the vast majority of the poor people you're talking about live in rural areas and they're farmers. Uh, so I'm particularly intrigued and I'd like to hear you address a little bit what 
role did the growth of agricultural productivity mm. in some of these countries play? I, I could have predicted you would ask me that question, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you, if you could talk about that. Um, the second aspect to that question, of course, is malnutrition still persists yeah. in a lot of these areas. Right. Um, and um, my last uh, thing is a plug for my uh, hero, Norman Borlaug, who when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, said, we do have the technology yep. to feed a planet of 10 billion people. Yep. The question is whether or not we'll be able to He's use right. that technology or not. Yep, and Borlaug is right at the beginning of that upward slope. I thought you were going to say he's up in heaven. <laughs> well, that's but, true, too. But, well, he's up there, too. He is up there, too. He, he I just, I just want to note that uh, Joanna Nessa and Connie Villet are here, both folks who have been very active on the conversation around food security, and, and Joanna started our food security program at, at CSIS. So. Where's Connie? And then uh, the gentleman Connie. here. Where's Connie? In the, she's over there. Oh, sorry, not, Lori Rowley. Lori's oh, okay. here. Sorry. <laughs> I think of you together as both my, my friends, and I think of you together. Sorry, Lori. You know what I mean. Yes, uh, thank you very a much for the association. A great presentation. I am Dr. Nisar Chaudhary with the Pakistan American League. You gave a very expanded picture regarding quality of life that has improved with passage of time. But at the same time, most of the countries now are concerned more about security. Mm -hmm. They get clean water. But what kind of sense of security and sense of safety they would feel when most of their resources they are diverting towards buying arms are developing elements of human destruction? Sorry, so Thank say you. that again. So most countries are focusing on security. Security, yeah. safety. Yeah. As you know, the entire bell starting from Myanmar, you mentioned Bangladesh, India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, yeah. Syria, Iraq, Libya, right. going even to Europe even, you have seen terrorist act right. in Belgium, in France, and even in USA. Yeah. So the, the sense, the security element, do you include the security element well, in this quality of life? If somebody is getting the right. clean water, but does good. he feel safe also? Good, good question. Thank you. Okay, so let okay, me so go we got around, four really around, good questions. around the horn, and no more than four because I right, probably right. won't be able to remember these four That's as we right. go along. But, but Ishra, good question, and it's great to see you. Um, uh, so you are pointing out the, the, uh, the, I think the short answer here is our, in the United States, our failures in. Uh, in adapting to globalization. And both and, major and, presidential candidates have backed away from TPP, for example. Yep. And we've blown it, frankly, in this country over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and, and all countries gain from trade. We all know that. And that is taken to mean t that all people gain from trade, which is absolutely false. There are a lot of losers out there. And both parties, frankly, in this country for the last 30 years have tended to ignore that fact, <laughs> that people are going to lose from this globalization, even as the United States as a whole will win. And I think that goes a long way to, you know, those of us that are economists and look at the data, you know, we've done pretty well because of globalization, and we have. But the fact is that many, many, many Americans have lost out. And where we have failed is to implement programs and policies that are actually directly and robustly aimed at helping the people that are going to lose. We've sort of hid behind this thing of the gainers outweigh the losers, and you know if you're a loser, kind of too bad. And and we put out, you know, fairly weak programs of get some training, come over here, and we'll teach you how to, uh, we'll teach you Word, and good luck getting a job, or you know those kinds of things. We have uh, uh, those kinds of training programs as opposed to really robust investments to say, first of all, we're going to invest much more heavily in our public school system, because if we don't educate our kids, we can't compete. And but, well, sorry, to take an approach that says, good for the rest of the world, they're up in their game, and, but instead of blocking the way and closing off trade, we have to up our game to compete. And if we do that, we will all be better off. That's what we have failed to do. So how do we up our game? so that we can compete, so that we continue to get, well, we invest in our schools. What have we done over the last 30 years? We've disinvested in our public schools, and, and, and they're not very good. Uh, we invest in our infrastructure. What have we done over the last 30 years? We've ignored it, so our infrastructure is crumbling. 
We invest in universities and research centers so we can develop the cutting edge technology for the next generation of technology. We haven't done that. For people who lose their jobs, we recognize it and we give them serious training programs and actually probably uh, subsidizing their wages working with firms where, they're, uh, where they actually get jobs and we, the public, the government actually pays for it so that they get internships and can learn skills. We pay relocation expenses so they're not out in the rural areas of West Virginia, but they're in Denver or Arizona or places that are booming where there are jobs. And we, we haven't been willing to do it as a society. And I think what's happening to a large degree is we're, is we're getting the blowback uh, because we have failed to invest in our schools and our infrastructure. And so that's partly what I mean by going forward. This is a matter of choice. And if we choose to continue on that path where we think that it's all going to automatically take care of itself, we'll fail. If we choose instead to begin to actually seriously invest and recognize that some people lose and that we're going to have to invest in those people and invest in our game and education technology and infrastructure, then our growth rate can continue and that will actually be helpful for the world as a whole. So this is a much longer debate, but that's where I would, mm. you know, we have failed. Uh, to actually recognize that people lose from that. Kind of your question on, on, on data. Uh, I thought you were going to ask a slightly different question because I, I have had some people just throw mud at me saying this is all World Bank data and so therefore it's false. Um, mm. um, <laughs> the world, my source is World Bank, the World Development Indicators, which is actually a repository of data that comes from many, many different sources, as you know. Um, uh, uh, and, and, but what's interesting to me when I put this together is that it's not just World Bank. I was looking at um, you know, national accounts data on GDP. I was looking at trade data, which is a different source. I was looking at poverty data, which is household surveys. I was looking at health data, which is coming from the WHO. I'm looking at education data coming from UNESCO. I'm looking at uh, data on, on democracy from Freedom House and from the Polity 4 Index. I'm looking at indices of war and conflict from other indices, and all of them are pointing to this general improvement that all of them started changing in the 1990s. You know, very different indicators of de development from very different sources. And I think that's actually one of the strongest things about this is that it's actually quite different data sources and quite different indicators. And they're all telling kind of the same picture. So that's one. Now, on the specific issues of the informal economy, we don't know, obviously, but the fact that we've got household survey data, as distinct from the national accounts, which is at the core of these poverty data, begins to say something about welfare of the most marginalized people. Whether they got their income in the formal economy or informal economy, I don't know, but their household surveys are showing that they're better off. The health data. I don't know whether they're working in the informal sector or the formal sector, but fewer of their kids are dying. Mm. I don't know, you know, the education data, more of their kids are getting into school and more of them are girls. The hunger data, which I'll talk about, far fewer people are, 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 are deprived of, of food and are, are hungry. So the indicators, many of whom, we can't tell exactly who's in the informal sector, but a lot of them are, uh, that this welfare is improving, suggests indirectly that the informal sector is showing a lot of, uh, of, of action uh, and, and dynamism in these countries that are moving forward. Again, not in, not in the Hades of the world, but in the Indonesias of the world and the Ghanas of the world. And that accords, I mean, with what I see when I go to a Ghana or when I go to a, a, a Senegal. <laughs> and the markets are going crazy in both rural and urban and, and there's a lot of action out there. So wh where we don't have good data, uh, I think indirectly we get at it. Now, the last part of your question, we need to do a better job collecting data. We're far better, with, we've got far better data now than we had 20 or 30 years ago. But one of the questions about the World Bank, um, they should be actually using a lot of their funding to collect even more and more data on issues that we don't know much about. And it is one of the roles where they have done well, but they should be doing better. And, and I don't hear that argument you know, for the bank to go out and, 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 and collect even more data so we actually have a better idea in failed states and fragile states mm -hmm. on food, on informal economic activities, in you know, improving the national accounts as nice as they are. We're about 80 years you know, out of date in how we, how we think about it uh, you know, in, in those kinds of in environmental degradation and 
Um, the bank should be much more of a repository for, for that kind of data. Uh, Tom, good question, thank you. Um, uh, there's no question that this starts with agriculture, really. And mm -hmm. I talked about China, but what did China do first? It decollectivized agriculture. And it opened up the power of the, of the rural economy to take off. They then switched a lot of their focus uh, to, uh, to the coastal areas and to the special economic zones, and I think ignored agriculture a little bit too much. But even within China, the agricultural sector has been growing quite rapidly now for 30 or 40 years. And as you pointed out in other developing countries, it starts with Norman and Bulag and, and the Green Revolution, which is a story both about technology and agriculture being at the core of this. In the 1960s, uh, you know, the populate, Paul Ehrlich wrote the population bomb. Uh, and, and, and those of you as old as I am remember all the fears that, uh, that the world couldn't handle four billion people and we were gonna run out of energy and we're in the 1970s seven billion people, and we're right? now at seven billion more prosperously. Now, that doesn't mean it can be sustained because we do have a climate change problem and, and other resources, but it does mean that when we have put our heads together and invested in the technology, actually with more people on the planet, we've had more brains, <laughs> not just more mouths to feed, but more brains that can figure out the new technological advances. And Norman Borlaug showed the way, and, and the, the future is that we need to invest in drought-resistant seeds and heat-resistant seeds and desalinization of water, which we know how to do, but it's expensive. If we can drop the cost curve on desalinating water in the next 20 years, it changes everything in a really big way. I mean, we've got a lot of water, it's just got a lot of salt in it. And you know, I'm no scientist, but it's not that complicated to take salt out of water. What we need to do is to drop that cost curve. And if we can do that while we're coming up with drought resistant heat uh, seeds and heat resistant seeds, and we're also continuing to expand new sources of energy, which drop the cost curve for energy in developing countries in more sustainable ways and opens up energy opportunities for people off the grid in rural areas so that they can now get solar panels and at least get a little bit of electricity even if they're miles away from the grid, that just changes everything. If we make those choices and make those investments, it's gonna continue. If we don't, it's not. But, you know, but the core on agriculture, and people forget this, is that you got to invest in agriculture. It's the first stage of the structural transformation. And only with productive agriculture do you actually free up labor to go into manufacturing and to everything else. And the countries, mm. the Koreas and the Indonesias and the Taiwans and the Thailands that have succeeded in getting manufacturing going and China, were only able to do that by having a productive agricultural sector where they could produce a lot of food, keep wages down because food was relatively cheap, and move people into manufacturing. And we're seeing the beginnings mm -hmm. of that in sub-Saharan Africa, but only the beginnings. Of okay, that. Last, so your last question here. The last question, which was on security. Yeah, you've really got to, the security is at, at the core of this because, um, uh, and, and you point a lot in South Asia, and it's still uh, an unsettled place, to say the least, which you know more about than I do, less violent than it has been at some times in the future. But if, you, if we do not have that basic security, development can't happen. Uh, and again, the core function of a state is uh, security of its people. That's, that's the whole basic purpose. And in the absence of that security, whether it's around violence, um, uh, uh, civil war, whether it's around injustice on land rights, whether you, you've got to have an effective state that creates that personal security and societal security. And it's only then that you can begin to get people having, investing in a, a new small business, uh, sending their kids to school, being confident that if they send their daughter to school, she'll be safe, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, uh, believing that they can go uh, and to a health clinic and they can build it and they can make those investments. So, um, so that's at the core. Now, exactly what the solution is in South Asia with Pakistan and India and, and Bangladesh and Nepal, I don't know other than I will say this. Um, I think that the future of India is one of it, perhaps the most important thing to keep our eyes on in the next 40 or 50 years. People talk a lot about China, and rightly so. India becomes the largest country in the world in, by 2022, in six years. Becomes larger in population than China. And it is a democracy. Messy, <laughs> but it's a democracy, and has been. So in one of the most difficult places in the world, we have a large, thriving democracy, which can be a model for success for the countries in the region. 
I was just recently in Myanmar. Myanmar's natural market for its agricultural goods is India. Pakistani businessmen want to do business with Indian businessmen. Afghanistan, if it has an economic future, its market is not here. <laughs> it's not in Europe. Afghanistan's natural market is India. So we need India to thrive economically and politically as an example, but as an engine for that whole region. And, and I think that that's the core. And the, the more successful one is, the more successful the others will be. Bangladesh has become quite successful. Pakistan's moving in the right uh, direction, but lots of fragility. And as a global community, we need to invest in their mm. security and their economic success and their political development as the core. And if that part of the world becomes more stable, then Iraq and Iran next door, you know, there, there's a good story that you can tell about a, a successful India and a successful South Asia beginning to expand. But you can also tell a story of failure, of nuclear weapons and somebody pushing a button and, and everything blowing up. But that part of the world, I think, will be one of the most important in determining whether these kinds of trends continue in a positive way or whether we go backwards security-wise and, and economic-wise. Please join me in thanking Steve Radlett. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. You stick Thank around you. for a few minutes. You